as your weight goes up, the size of your brain goes down, it's like, oh my God, if 70% of us are overweight, it's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. In fact, it's a national security crisis because they're not letting as many, not as many people are eligible to sign up for military service because we just have an unhealthy mm. population. Talk to me about diet's impact on that. What are some um, main sort of ballpark things that you should be pulling out? You know, it's not hard. And again, if I put this, these things on the board, people would get it. Sugar is pro-inflammatory. It increases erratic brain cell firing and it's addictive. So if you can get rid of or really limit sugar, that's really helpful for people. The more colorful, clean fruits and vegetables, the better. The, the one misnomer people often have is, oh, I should go on a low-fat diet. The problem with that is 60% of the solid weight of your brain is fat, and low-fat diets can actually trigger depression. Mm -hmm. And so I like healthy fat, fish, although um, clean fish. Um, and so swordfish is out. and never would have that. It's just loaded with mercury. And I'm a huge fan of salmon, wild salmon, um, avocados. They're like God's butter, right? It's just a great brain food for you. Um, you have to be calorie smart uh, because 70% um, of us are overweight, 40% of us are obese. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the physical size and function of your brain goes down. Mm -hmm. should scare the fat off anyone. When I read that, I ended up losing 30 pounds. You know, I'd like tried for 30 years, and I just never really had the motivation until I went, I am not going to have a smaller <laughs> brain. I am not going to do that. Um, so clean protein, healthy fat, actually at every meal because it helps stabilize your blood sugar. One of the biggest things that will steal your mind is have a high fasting blood sugar level. Um, it's actually been shown to be associated with brain atrophy and it makes your blood vessels brittle and more likely to break. So there's a term I like, I didn't coin it, but I like it called diabesity. It's a combination of being overweight with high blood sugar. It's a disaster for brain function. And this is why people get addicted. It's carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates. So if you ingest cupcake, mm -hmm. your pancreas sees all the sugar and it sends out an insulin burst. Well, that insulin burst drives tryptophan, the amino acid precursor to serotonin, into your brain. So when you eat bread or pasta or potatoes, your brain likes it because it feels happier. It feels more relaxed. Now, the problem is it kills you early. <laughs> and so you have to sort of take this. But you know, the other thing that drives tryptophan into the brain is exercise. And so, and many of my athletes, they exercise intensely so they don't get depressed. Mm. And when they get hurt, they get depressed because they can't get their antidepressant fix. And so they'll go to sugar and then that'll make them feel terrible about themselves. And so know what's good for tryptophan to getting into your brain and know what's bad. So before we started rolling, you said something so fascinating. And you said, if I were basically an evil genius and I wanted to just absolutely destroy people's health, I would create what kind of lifestyle? So let's just take this mnemonic I've created on how to keep your brain healthy. It's called Bright Minds. Mm -hmm. And so if I was the evil ruler, the B in Bright Mind stands for blood flow is I would give all children social media and video games and encourage them to play as much as they could because that would drop blood flow to their brain. Brand new study, the more screen time, the smaller the brain. That's it's a little Why? horrifying. Well, one, they're not going outside. They're not getting exercise. They're not getting the sun. Mm -hmm. We have That's a massive deficiency of vitamin D in this country. And exercise increases something called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It helps your brain. 
grow. So we're losing miracle grow. Retirement and aging is the R in bright minds. If I was an evil ruler, I would let everybody retire at 55 and <laughs> not have to, and then I'd put them in front of the TV there and make them angry at you know, whatever political fight is going on. Uh, the eye is inflammation, which comes basically from low omega-3 fatty acid levels, processed foods, gut problems. And so I'd like, oh, nobody gets fish in my kingdom. And we don't have fresh food. Um, we basically have fast food restaurants. Um, the G is genetics. Um, and I don't know what you have in your family. In mine, I have heart disease and obesity. Obesity in a big way in my family. Yeah, but as you, we can see, genes are not a death sentence. Mm. They should be a wake-up call to do the right things to decrease your genetic vulnerability. So if I was the evil ruler, I would go, you have obesity in your family. I'd do a public campaign. So it's in your family, why worry about it? Live it up, you're gonna die early, enjoy the path. As opposed to what I think is actually more rational is you have this vulnerability, you need to be really serious about your health. H is head trauma. Um, I'd encourage all kids to hit soccer balls with their head, to play tackle football, to ride horses. And people go, well, why are you down on horses? It's like, well, what killed Superman? Mm. It was a horse. I can't tell you the number of patients I see who had serious addictions because they had fallen off of a horse and had no frontal lobe wow. function. The T is toxins. So if I was the evil ruler, I would get rid of all of the environmental protections so that we are filled with air pollution, water pollution. And I would never, I would tell the manufacturers they don't have to put the ingredients on the labels not only for food, but also for personal products. And one of the things, things like parabens and phthalates are hormone disruptors, mm -hmm. and aluminum, and we're putting them on our body. Whatever goes in your body, goes on your body, goes in your mm -hmm. body, becomes your body. Um, I'd think of alcohol as a health food. We've certainly had that craze. <laughs> I would legalize, um, not only legalize marijuana, but it's like, let's not say it's good for us because all of my published research says it's bad. Mm. That, now, does that mean if someone's dying of cancer and it'll help their pain and help the nausea and help them eat, God bless them, right? I mean, so let's be rational about it. I just saw someone who had been smoking pot for 50 years and his brain was remarkably older than he was. Um, the M is mental health. And um, if I was the evil ruler, I'd create CNN and Fox News. And that, it, that ruins people's health because they always lead with negative, they increase anger and frustration and polarization. The more you're exposed to it, the angrier you get. Mm. And the more it separates you from other people. Um, the I is immunity and infections. I would belittle people who are testing patients for Lyme disease. My great stories are patients who have Lyme. One girl, she's 16, she became psychotic after a visit to Yosemite, and she went to had three psychiatric hospitalizations. None of the medications worked. She became a shell of herself. She came to our clinic. And I'm like, so what happened at Yosemite? And her mother said, we were surrounded by six deer. And we thought it was a magical moment. She got bit by a deer tick that caused Lyme, that then caused her to lose her mind. And on an antibiotic, she got her mind back. The end is neurohormone deficiencies. And so letting kids hit things with their head actually drops their hormone levels. And so I'd test for that. Diabetes, I'd create the American food system. ISIS has nothing on our food industry. The real, and I'm not kidding when I say it, the weapons of mass destruction are highly processed, pesticide sprayed, high glycemic, low fiber, food-like substances stored in plastic containers. Mm. They're ruining our health. If I'm right, you know, and I'm not the only one who's published this, there's been, I think, 20 other scientists 
as your weight goes up, the size of your brain goes down, it's like, oh my God, if 70% of us are overweight, it's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. In fact, it's a national security crisis because they're not letting as many, not as many people are eligible to sign up for military service because we just have an unhealthy mm. population. And if I was an evil ruler, I would create screens that have blue lights because they disrupt sleep. Because uh, the S in bright minds is sleep. So there's so many things happening that I'm just, yeah. it gives me pause about yeah. the society we're raising our babies and grandbabies in. Yeah, I was gonna say a lot of what you're describing sounds like what we're encountering every day. So if that's the way to really mess people up, then what is the lifestyle that is gonna help us supercharge? So you talked about sleep. Um, where where should we be at? How much sleep are we talking about? Does time of day matter? Like, um, and not just sleep, what is the idealized lifestyle? So if we just go back through those um, bright minds risk factors, so with blood flow, it's exercise. Simple supplements like ginkgo and vinpocetine boost blood flow to the brain. Simple foods like beets or cayenne pepper, rosemary. So there are dietary things you can do. There are lifestyle things. Exercise One thing on is blood so flow you said that I thought was really interesting is um, what happens in the heart happens to the brain, happens to the genitals. Um, and what's the stat on the number of 40 and 50 and 60 year olds that have erectile dysfunction? It's insane. 40% of 40 year olds. 70% of 70 year olds. And if you have blood flow problems anywhere, it likely means they're everywhere. Mm. And it's one of the, I don't wanna say big benefits, that's bad. But it's one of the benefits of the program, almost everybody's sex life gets better. Mm. Which I'm like a huge fan hey. of. But this is, you know, for years, my antidepressants, not mine, but you know, like Prozac and Zoloft and Lexapro, they decrease sexual function, mm. which that makes me sad, right? It makes it harder for women to have an orgasm or harder um, for men to perform, right? And I'm like, well, let me give you something that'll enhance your performance because your mood will be better. And I'm always thinking, what I do for you, how is that going to affect your partner? Because right. I, I never think of myself as your psychiatrist. I always think of myself as your family's psychiatrist because I see little kids and old people and everybody in between. So exercise. So for retirement and aging, I want you working in a job that you're passionate about, that you're purposeful with. And if you're not, and some people just aren't, mm. it's well, what are you doing for new learning every day? What do you do for new learning every day? Is so it all I, around the brain or do you have stuff outside of that? No, in fact, it shouldn't be. Like I know how to read brain scans. Just reading more scans doesn't really help my mm. brains. Pattern recognition. So I play the piano, which I really like. Um, Simply Piano is my app for playing the piano, which is good, which is good for my cerebellum. Mm. And then I have a table tennis coach. And you it's have a like, table tennis coach? I do. That's right, you played at the national level, didn't you? I did, but you wanna get better. And the only way you get better is pay, play people better than you. Mm. And so, so I do that. The I is take fish oil and a probiotic. Because what do you think oh. about keto? So I being inflammation. So um, keto is the only thing in my life that had a, a drug-like effect when I tried it. I had suffered from inflammation for like 15 years. I was icing my wrists every night because they just hurt and just to keep them in check. But I wasn't doing any fat in my diet. I basically lived in a state of rabbit starvation for two or three years. And then for the potential anti-cancer properties, I'd been hearing about ketogenics, thanks to Peter Atia and Dom D'Agostino, and I thought, all right, I'm gonna give this a shot. I went hardcore, four to one. Uh, so for every combined gram of protein and carbohydrate, I was eating four grams of fat. It was miserable, I hated it the most, but my wrist felt amazing. Um, that was really transformative for me. What, what are your thoughts on keto? Well. Uh, I'm a fan of it for neurodegenerative diseases and for seizures. In fact, I have a granddaughter who has a wicked seizure disorder mm -hmm. and on a ketogenic diet, she lost her seizures. Wow. It's actually one of my passion stories because when I suggested it, she's five months old, she's having 160 seizures a day and on the diet, she lost her seizures. But the reason I'm not a fan in general is there's not enough colorful plants and plants have medicine. So for your pain, 
it may have been dairy or it may have been gluten or it may have been corn or it may have been soy, those things that mm. tend to go away on a ketogenic diet, it could have been one of those things as well that was driving the inflammation. Because a lot of people would argue that meat can drive inflammation as well. And the first thing I do with almost all of my patients that aren't getting better is I put them on an elimination diet. Mm. And I have to tell you, the nutritionists in my clinics, they have more success stories than the psychiatrists. So one story, I had a guy that was severely depressed. He had ECT, he'd been hospitalized, electric shock therapy. Oh, he had been hospitalized multiple times, he was suicidal. He said to me, he said, you're my last hope. I get that a lot. That's a little bit stressful for me. Okay. Um, and I'm like, nothing's worked. I want you to try an elimination diet. He's like, do I have to? I'm like, really? <laughs> Yes, you have to. And so what does that mean? No gluten, no dairy, um, kill the sugar, no corn, no soy, no artificial dyes or preservatives. He's like, that's my whole diet, but I'll do it. Three weeks later, he's dramatically better. Wow. But then I said, so let's see what it is. So we added back gluten, mm. nothing happened. We added back dairy, nothing happened. We added back corn. He said within 20 minutes, he had a vision of a gun in his mouth pulling Whoa. the trigger. I'm like, we have to break up with corn. Huh. And his depression has not come back. Wow, that's crazy. That, Isn't that, that crazy? Yeah, and I mean, I should be used to that at this point, like the number of people that have that kind of reaction to a specific type of food and how variable it is, meaning maybe corn for me is fine, but for him is absolutely catastrophic. Um, and how much variability do you see um, how do you, because an elimination diet can be very confusing for people. How do you walk people through uh, that? You just have to think of it really simply. It's, these are foods I get to choose and these are the foods I should lose. And you just have to know the list. And but like, where do you start? Hard. Is there a, a ground zero? Like, is it chicken, breast, and broccoli? Like, what is your start here? Well, you see, for me, the first rule is it has to be delicious Interesting. and nutritious. So I, I'm fortunate that I'm married to a nurse who not only is beautiful, but she's really smart. And one of her best gifts is taking um, really healthy food and making it taste awesome. Mm -hmm. So there is no suffering. So you have to get that in their head. And we're all creatures of routine. I mean, I'm so a creature of routine. So that means I really only have to find 20 foods I love that love me back. Right. <laughs> and I don't know in your relationship if you've ever been in love that was bad for you, if you've ever had a bad relationship. But I have, and I'm not doing it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm damn sure not doing it with food. So, because I have control over that. Do I love this and does it love me back? I'm not gonna be in love with something that hurts me. Mm -hmm. I did the Daniel plan. Pastor Rick Warren called me up and said, I'm fat, my church is fat, will you help me? We created a program uh, for them, Mark Hyman and I did, and thousands of churches around the world had done it, it's, wow. it's awesome. But one of the pastor's wives came into my office and she said, I told my husband last night after you gave a lecture that I'd rather get Alzheimer's disease than give up sugar. Whoa. And I'm like, did you date the bad boys in high school? Because that's a bad relationship. Wow. And later we found out she has a family history of Alzheimer's and she's given up sugar. But the insanity around food is, mm. is crazy. Dude, that, that like actually makes me emotional. That's crazy. It's crazy. But so many, they're attached to, you know, at the holidays, this is how my mother loved me, mm. so if I give this up, it's like giving up my mother. And you really have to understand the attachments to the different foods they have, but then get them attached to new foods by showing them it can be both delicious and nutritious. I was watching or listening to a, a podcast that you did with somebody, and they were asking you like final questions, and they said, what do you wish you were better at, or something like that, and you said, um, the one thing I wish I could do was get more people to change. And I thought, God, I so get that. Like, I'm, I totally agree with you. But I imagine it meaning that you tell people, hey, this is what you need to do. Like, even your own father for years, like, wouldn't listen. And then, obviously, <laughs> he finally has his breakthrough moment. But 
What have you learned in all of that to get to the point where you have maybe a better success rate than somebody else, even though still far too many people would rather get Alzheimer's and can actually say it out loud, which is just beyond crazy to me. Um, but where have you had successes with that? What are some takeaways that people watching this can try to implement? Because I, I know it is true, if, even if it's only me, there are people watching this that either they need to change or maybe more importantly, someone they love needs to change and they just don't know how to help them. Well, if you want to help someone else, and my dad's story is a great story, you have to live the message. If you don't live the message, you suck as a messenger. And too many physicians don't live the message of health and so therefore they're not good at changing behavior in their patients and so they end up just one medicine after the other, which I think is bad medicine. Um, so the first thing is you have to live it. And then you have to find smart ways to get them interested. So I start an exercise with all of my patients called the One Page Miracle. So on one piece of paper, I want you to write out what you want. What do you want in your relationships, in your work, in your money, in your physical, emotional, and spiritual health? What do you want? Write it down. And then I want you to ask yourself, does your behavior get you what you want? Because I realize nobody does it because they should do it. Um, but they're more likely to do it if it fits, if it's their goal. So I want to live a long time because I love my mission. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. So you have to understand, so why do you want to be healthy? So that really becomes primary. So you live it, you get them into what their motivation is, and then you make it as simple as possible. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Mm -hmm. um, start every day with today is going to be a great day because then your unconscious mind will find why it's going to be a great day. Or end every day with, well, what went well today? Just to begin to direct your mind. So I find I have to make it really simple. And I have this huge benefit. I have pictures. You know, 30% of the brain is dedicated to vision. Mm -hmm. And so I can show you, here's a healthy scan, here's your scan. I'm sort of hoping you'll get some anxiety over it, right? Ramp up your anxiety so you do better. That's what I've seen. I had this one guy from the Valley came to see me and he was really, his wife was concerned, he was really depressed. And his brain looked like he had Alzheimer's disease. And I'm like, how much do you drink? And he's like, I'm never drunk. I'm like, that's not the question. How much do you drink? <laughs> and he was like having three scotches a day. Whoa. And he was overweight. And I added up the calories that he was drinking a year at three scotches a day. It was 30 pounds of fat he was putting on his body just from those calories. Mm. And, but when he saw his scan, he got appropriately anxious stopped drinking, started with the Bright Minds habits, mm. and completely transformed his life in six months. Wow, that, that is really pretty extraordinary. One thing, um, again, you keep throwing out these little nuggets that I find so interesting, is starting the day, putting your feet on the ground, and saying this is gonna be a great day. Like these, um, the, the, I call them soft things, but they're so powerful. One thing you talked about that I absolutely love is, uh, I forget the exact phrase you used, but basically to bathe in happiness, to just drink that in. One, why is that important? And then two, how do we actually do that? Well, in my new book, um, Feel Better Fast and Make It Last, which I'm really excited about, is there's an exercise in Feel Better Fast. It's about flooding all five of your senses at once with happiness. I mean, that's why you have senses. It brings the world in. Well, why not bring it in in a happy way rather than in a terrifying way? So they're visual things like images of nature. Although on my phone, it's like, here are my favorites. And I can just go to it and it makes me happy because it triggers happy memories for me. Um, listening to sounds of nature, like the rain or the ocean or certain music, like for me, it's good vibrations from the Beach Boys. Um, what are the scents? What are the touches? What are the tastes, the smells that can trigger happiness? Mm -hmm. So vanilla, of all things, uh, honeysuckle, jasmine, have been found in scientific studies to trigger happiness. 
See, I actually think we carry memories from other people. So, uh, epigenetically, in the book you talk about how you can train a mouse to be afraid of a cherry blossom tree for three generations, which is crazy. Is that what you mean, or are you talking about something else? Yeah. My grandfather, for example, when he was 19, he came from the Middle East, came to Los Angeles. His brother, who was a bad driver, borrowed his sister's car and was killed in a train accident. Oof. And he's 19. My grandfather never drove because that anxiety got solidified in his brain. And that happened before he was involved in making my father. And so the anxiety I carry may not just be mine, that it may actually come from the experiences of generations, mm -hmm. that I think a lot of it didn't start with me. Um, and so we know, for example, children of Holocaust survivors have a higher incidence of PTSD. 30% of children of soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan who had PTSD, 30% of their children had PTSD. They call it secondary PTSD. And so I think of these as ancestral dragons. It's like, well, what's the issue that actually may not be your issue? And so I think it's really important for you to know about your mom and your grandma and your grandfather on her side and your dad and their ancestors because it's not just the genes we inherit. It's the scratches on them that turn on or off those genes that make anxiety, depression, much more common in future generations. So for example, the end of mental illness is dedicated to my two nieces, Amelie and Alizé. They're 10 and 15 and um, they have mental illness throughout their whole family. Um, family history of suicides, multiple suicides, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, addiction, borderline personality, criminal behavior. But genes only load the gun. It's what happens to us that pulls the trigger. And unfortunately, they were raised in chaos mm -hmm. with um, parents who su suffered with depression, addiction, domestic violence. They had multiple moves. And so the whole idea behind the end of mental illness is how do I end it in these girls mm -hmm. and in their babies and grandbabies. And what you do is you put their bodies and their brain in a healing environment. So we work on the actual physical functioning of their bodies. And um, Alizé, when I scanned her at 13, her brain looked terrible. And was that because her mom drank when she was pregnant? Was it because they lived in a mold-filled home? What? I don't know. But repairing that is absolutely essential to her doing well in school for her picking a good partner for her and not continuing the cycle of psychiatric problems. The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I wanna take you through that will 100X your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. So what are the, the sort of baseline things we do? Uh, you talk about diet in the book, not being addicted to flaming Cheetos anymore. What are, uh, <laughs> what are some of the, the things that you did to help them out? So for Alizé, I mean, first it starts with feeding them right. Um, and then supplementation, multiple vitamin, fish oil, optimize her vitamin D level, put, gave her a brain boost that has seven different things to optimize brain function. Um, put her in a hyperbaric chamber, that made a big difference for her. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is really intriguing. For people that don't know what it is, walk them through what it does and why it's useful. So I've published a number of studies on it and probably have a thousand patients with scans before wow. and after. 
And the reason it's like, why do I care? I'm a psychiatrist. Why do I want to put you in a hyperbaric chamber that puts you under pressure with increased oxygen? Mm. Because it increases blood flow to the brain. Well, for Alizé, she had low blood flow. And so she had about 40 dives, so about 40 hours in a hyperbaric chamber. Whoa. I'm in a new docu-series with Justin Bieber, and the hyperbaric chamber is all over the docu-series about him getting zipped in and zipped out, because when I scanned him, initially had really low blood flow to his brain, and he feels less anxious because he has better blood flow to his brain. And so that was one of the cornerstones for Alizé. And then I teach her anomaly, the little one, not to believe every stupid thing they think. This is really important. So we talk about hardware and software. Optimize the physical functioning of your brain and you do it by going after all the risk factors, blood flow being one of them. But then as you optimize the physical functioning, she's got a lot of bad programming because she grew up in chaos and chaos gives you sort of a hyperactive emotional brain and your brain automatically goes to the dark place. And so every morning um, we say, today is going to be a great day. Why? Because then your unconscious mind will find, well, why is today going to be a great day? I get to hang out with you, so that makes me happy. At the end of the day, we always talk about, well, what went well today? It's training your mind, but also setting up your dreams to be more positive. And if your dreams are more positive, you'll be in deeper REM state, which is a more healing state for your dreams. That's so simple, but really, really powerful. This is something, man, as you're talking, it's like, I know some of this stuff. And even that one, like, setting that intention before I go to bed would be better than what I'm doing now, which is just sort of tumbling into bed and going to sleep. And it's yeah. so cool because you're probably like me and you're just busy and you have a lot to do and you want to accomplish a lot. And so my days just go so fast. And when I close my eyes and go, what went well today? I begin to remember these phenomenal touch points that I just sort of breezed over and I, I love that and then I have a little tiny habit um, I worked with Professor BJ Fogg for six months on creating tiny habits for brain health and the mother tiny habit is before you do anything before you say anything you just ask yourself is this good for my brain or bad for it and if I love myself which I do I'm going to make better decisions. So is this good for my brain or bad for it? If you can answer that question with information and love, your brain's going to be better. Yeah, it's one of those, it's really simple and not a lot of people do it. Give me some more on the tiny habits. You pepper them throughout the book, but uh, what are some other tiny habits that either you use or you've got your nieces using? Um, so if the first one is just, is this good for my brain or not? What are some others? Whenever you feel sad, mad, nervous, or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And then ask yourself if it's true. And there's a whole process in the book uh, to not believe every stupid thing you think. And then when you go to say something to your wife or at work, does it fit? There's an exercise actually in all of my books basically called The One Page Miracle on one piece of paper. Write down what you want. Your relationships, your work, your money, your physical, emotional, spiritual health. What do you want? I think everything starts with what do you want? And then does your behavior get you what you want? So for example, with my wife, I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. I always want that. I don't always feel like that. Sometimes I'll get a rude thought in my head when I'm having a bad day or she didn't do, she's not great about closing cabinet doors. And, um, and I've come to believe I would so much rather have her in this house with the cabinet door open than have her not there. So I like let it go because being a jerk 
doesn't fit the goal I have for my marriage. But it starts with telling your frontal lobe, so that's the front third of your brain, largest in humans than any other animal by far, this is what makes us human, but you have to tell it what you want so over time you match your behavior to get mm. what you want. So it starts with that and then does it fit? Mm. I love that idea of telling your brain what you want, especially if I'm talking to an entrepreneur they don't know what they want. So they have like a vague idea, but they don't really know the specifics of what they want. And my thing is, if you want to get somewhere, if you're really trying to accomplish something, the amount of hard work, of practice, of learning that you're gonna have to do is really pretty extraordinary. But if you're not aiming that at the right thing, then you're never gonna make progress. And so everything that you're trying to accomplish in your life has to be so clear that it boils down to something that you can do right now today. Do you have a process for people for that? Is it as simple as just writing it down? Like, how do you walk people through the idea of getting that level of clarity in their life? So I have virtually all of my patients start with the one page miracle on one piece of paper. And so as we do therapy over time, it's, does it fit? You know, does the food you're eating, does the thoughts you have, do your relationships fit? ultimately your purpose and all good businesses have plans they have business plans and they have goals and they have quarterly priorities and so on but very few people ever do that for themselves and when i first did it in 1986 i think it just helped me so much clarify because you know amen clinics and brain md are two companies um i didn't even imagine it back then, but it's consistent effort over a long period of time. You end up doing something special. You've written so many books on the topic, given so many talks and the shows you've done on PBS. I mean, it, this is a really big topic. How do you help people that feel overwhelmed, that don't know where to start, they don't know how to keep going? How do you give them that entry point? Well, that's why I write, you know, and that's why we have eight clinics. It's we want to coach them through it. And people go, oh, I can't afford to come to the clinic. Well, get a book, you can get it at the library. Um, there's so much free things online because our goal, if we're really gonna end mental illness, the end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. Mm -hmm. I talk about this concept, if I was an evil ruler, how would I create mental illness in America? Mm -hmm. We are creating it in America by the food we serve, by the news that is everywhere, sort of the toxic pit you against me, news cycles, social media, um, letting kids hit soccer balls with their head, having Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts selling poison. Uh, You're talking about cookies, I assume. Cookies, mm -hmm. yeah. And last year alone, nicotine use among Teenagers went up 36%. No. So Jewel is the an evil company. ruler strategy. It's, yeah, I mean, they have bubblegum flavored uh, vaping devices. That's directed at children. Hello. Um, we, we need to be more thoughtful. Talk um, to me more about toxins. So definitely, obviously, tobacco, marijuana, um, alcohol, like those are ones that I think most people, although I love what you say, alcohol is not a health food. It's not. Uh, I think that one may need to be said more, but there's someone, I don't think anybody thinks smoking is good for them, but what are some of the things that are problematic that we might not be aware of? Like firefighters, that was one um, because of the flame retardant in the clothing that I, I've only recently heard people start talking about what are some toxins that people are getting on a daily basis that they might not realize is a toxin? Well, pesticides, for example. Virtually all the corn is raised with pesticides. Virtually all the soy beans are raised with pesticides. And why don't you want food raised with pesticides? Because you ingest the pesticides and they begin to damage your microbiome. So I don't know if you had a lot of antibiotics when you were young, but kids who had a lot of antibiotics when they're young, they're anxious mm -hmm. because it damages their microbiome. What antibiotics kill? Bugs. And so you have these hundred trillion bugs in your gut. If you're damaging them, well, we've seen that goes with 
anxiety. W one of the toxins people don't know about, but clearly in the medical literature, is anesthesia. Children who have anesthesia have a higher incidence of learning disabilities and ADD, and adults who have anesthesia, especially around heart procedures, have a higher incidence of dementia. I mean, who thinks about that? It's like, I need surgery, I'll just get surgery. Now, often you need to get the surgery, but then you need to rehabilitate your brain as if you played in the NFL. Not for everybody, sure. but for some people. Mold exposure. So you and I both know Dave Asprey. Mm -hmm. Dave got scanned about 14 years ago. His brain looked like crap. And he found he was living in a mold-filled home. And 12 years later, his brain's much better mm -hmm. because, I mean, I think he's basically dedicated his life to creating brain health in other people. And so if we're gonna do a quick rundown of what those things are that they would do to heal and rehabilitate the brain, so we've talked about some, so um, hyperbaric oxygen may be extreme, but certainly they can do that, get their diet right. Um, sleep is gonna be huge. Um, ending any social, social isolation that you have, connecting to people. Um, what are some other... Don't be fat. That is straight to the point. Don't be fat. Um, I not? come from fat people. You and me both. Um, Why is it a problem? I, it actually of the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind, if you're overweight, you now have five risk factors. Um, the fat on your body is not your friend. It stores toxins, so that's one risk factor. It increases inflammation, that's another risk factor. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the blood flow to your brain goes down, which should scare the fat off anyone. Yeah. That's three. And it takes healthy testosterone, belly fat, and it flips it. It transforms it into unhealthy, cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. That's four. And then being overweight is five. And when you're overweight, your blood sugar often goes up as well. And that's part of being overweight. So yeah. it's just like when I first figured it out, I always carried like 20 extra pounds. Um, I lost the weight because I'm not going to shrink my brain, right? I'm never going to do anything I know purposefully to hurt myself. Why? And, and it's like, oh, you're too uptight. It's like, no, it's because I love myself. Why would I ever do something to hurt me unless I was sort of an idiot? Mm. Um, and I know that sounds harsh, but now that you know, we need to be eating in a way that's calorie smart and loaded with vegetables. There is a linear correlation to the number of fruits and vegetables you eat a day and your level of happiness. But the brain, you'll like this, the brain does what you allow it to do. And so whatever habit or whatever behavior you engage in, you're gonna do again. And so bad habits, they get stuck in your brain, just like good habits get stuck in your brain. So it just takes some retraining. So for example, when I sit down at a restaurant and they come always, you want alcohol, and they just drop bread on the mm -hmm. table. So I'm like, no to the alcohol, because if you drink alcohol before a meal, you're actually gonna order more food um, and you're more likely to order dessert. And no to the bread, why? Because it's a simple carbohydrate that quickly turns in your mouth, it starts turning to sugar, and it boosts a chemical called serotonin in your brain, which makes you happy. Right. But it drops your frontal lobes, making you more likely to order more and dessert. Mm. And so as soon as the waiter comes, I'm like, no on the alcohol, take the bread away. And now it's just an automatic response where the first couple of months of it, it was hard. My brain had to actually make new connections to say, here's a situation, say no. So speaking of the brain, if it's always listening, what is it always listening to? And what is this idea of dragons that you talked about in the book? I find this really useful. Well, your brain is always listening. It's listening to your past. It's listening to the food you eat. It's listening to marketers. It's listening. When you say it's listening to your past, is it listening to what you say about your past? Or are you using listen as sort of an umbrella for reliving 
the past for many people is always present for them. And I got this idea of dragons from the past that still breathe fire on your emotional brain. So I was doing a podcast with Dr. Sharon May, who's a friend of mine, relational therapist, and she started talking about dragons from the past that were ruining relationships. And then she and I started collaborating. It's like, well, let's identify the dragons. And we came up with 13 of them. And a couple, the pandemic just exploded, like the death dragon or the grief and loss dragon. Um, but my whole life, I was living with the invisible, abandoned or insignificant dragon, one of seven. Um, I was in the middle, I'm a second son in a Lebanese family, which means you're expendable, <laughs> um, which turned out to be beautiful because I didn't have to go in the grocery business, right. right? And Lebanese families, the oldest child, the oldest male child goes in the business. And is your brother still in the business? My brother is the president of the business. Wow. <laughs> Um, I don't think I'd ever heard you talk. I mean, your dad was really successful in the business that he built. I didn't realize just how much sort of, I guess, ended up not being familial pressure for you, but certainly would have been for your brother. Well, it's pressure. When you grew up with a dad that's very successful, I mean, he ended up being the chairman of the board of a $4 billion company. Wow. Um, you often just go like, I can never live up mm. to that. And so you're struggling in that comparison, which is actually the second dragon, the inferior flawed dragon. And I had that one in spades, you know, being short and second and, um, you know, it helped me in so many ways, right? The dragons have downsides, mm. but they also have upsides. If you have felt insignificant, well, I built a life based on being significant, and it sort of worked. So how do you help people reconcile that? Like when I, when I read the book, I'm hearing about these dragons, they mostly sound negative, but you, in terms of if they go unchecked, your prefrontal cortex is offline, it really does become pathological and it becomes a problem. But I'm obsessed with this idea that there's pathology on both sides. So if you have too much drive, it's gonna spill into pathology. You know, if you're feeling too broken, too inadequate, whatever. But if you don't have enough, there's also pathology on that side. How do you help people walk that balance? Is it the prefrontal cortex? Well, it's always this balance between your prefrontal cortex. So think of that as the break in your brain. But you don't want it too strong. When it works too hard, people have OCD. It's sort of like the break is always on. And so if you think of a car, like I like going to Big Bear, and think about coming down the hill, mm. you need a good prefrontal cortex. You need a good brake. Because if the brake's not on, you die because you go <laughs> off a cliff, which is apropos. People don't break their behavior, mm. and they make bad decisions, and so they die early. But if the brake is always on, you can't get down the hill either because it's like stop, stop, stop stop. Think of people who have OCD. So it's about balance between the front third of your brain, prefrontal cortex, and your emotional brain. Because we need passion. We need purpose. We need a reason to do something. But if it works too hard, we get sad, or we get too anxious, or we come traumatized. Mm -hmm. uh, the wounded dragons, just so common, way more common now since the pandemic. And wounded the dragon is I am broken in some way or something it's else? It's I've had trauma. Okay. And I tell Literal the stories of <laughs> reliving it was so hard for me. But when I was little, I had this beautiful white goat mm. who um, sugar. Was, was our pet, Sugar. Yeah. And um, I actually have this video. I did a public television special on the new book and I actually showed the video of me mm. when I'm five playing with sugar and sugars, kissing me. And, and it was just beautiful. Yeah. But sugar also liked my dad's roses. Mm -hmm. And so one day sugar went off to the farm, which means sugar got slaughtered. Right. And a couple of nights later, my dad and his brother were joking that they were feeding us sugar for dinner, which was incredibly traumatic for me. 
And years How later- How old were you at this point? Like six, five or six. Oof. And I mean, I, and I remember it like it's yesterday. But years later, I was in Monterey, Mexico, giving a big talk mm. and they have goat meat for sale in street vendors. Like we don't do that in the United States. Right. And as I walked by, I got flooded with that memory. And all of a sudden, I'm 43 or something, have a panic attack. Wow. Because the past is always connected to the present. Mm. And so if there's trauma, learning how, and I talk about this in the book, how to recognize it and disconnect from it. Okay, so that's recognizing it, disconnecting, doing the unwinding is a tall order. Before we get to that, can you, what are some of the most common dragons? And if you have one of these running rampant in your life, your prefrontal cortex isn't putting the brakes on it, what, what does that manifest as in, in the more common dragons? Well, so we've had over 100,000 people take the quiz knowyourdragons.com. So people can do that, it's free. And on average, people have six of them. So it's common to mm -hmm. have issues. And the anxious dragon is the most common. The responsible dragon, where you feel like you have to take care of other people, which actually can breed this thing called codependence and entitlement and others. You have to be careful with that. The wounded dragon, the inferior flawed dragon, it's very common. And it's basically, I compare myself to you in a negative way. Um, social media is driving that epidemic. Um, and the death dragon sort of surprised me, but you know, we did the study during COVID and- Is that a fear of death? It's the fear of death dragon. And a lot of people haven't come to grips with death. Like one of the strategies I have actually played out today is write down 10 good things about dying. Whoa. And, um, it's like, oh, well, that's okay. Because if it's inevitable, it is. Right. It's, it's like you have to learn to embrace it. And there's a lot of writing exercises in, in the book because I actually want people to write their story and give it the ending they want and then ask themselves every day, then kick in your prefrontal cortex. Is my behavior getting me what I want? Because too often people go for fixes that fail rather than fixes that fix. Okay, so first we're gonna identify our dragon. Okay, so I have the fear of death dragon or I have the anxiety dragon. As somebody who suffered with the anxiety dragon, that one's very easy for me to relate to. Okay, so I have the anxiety dragon. I'm obsessing about a future that I'm practicing the failure unintentionally. This was my thing. I would find my, what I thought of as exit ramps. Like if this situation becomes problematic, what's my exit ramp? But in thinking about all of my exit ramps, I was rehearsing it going wrong, 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 wrong. And when I'm journaling, the idea I wanna to bring together with this, so I, I identify my dragon, but now when I'm doing the journaling, how do I get to accurate thinking? Because the problem in the first place is that I have a cognitive distortion. I have a, a tendency to think of how the things could go wrong, or at least that felt like the right way to plan for the future. I've since stopped doing that. Um, how, how do you recognize what accurate thinking actually is? And you go through this in the book because you, you have that like four questions that you have people do, I think it was four. And there's a, a part in there where they would often say like, I'm gonna fail. Are you gonna fail? Yes. Like to them, that seems self-evidently true. So how do you help them recognize that that isn't actually accurate? I help them question it. Whenever you feel sad or mad or nervous or out of control, write out what you're thinking. Mm. And then it's five questions, but it's, is it true? Is it absolutely true with 100% certainty? Right. And that's the one that usually cracks it. It's like, um, worthless. Is it absolutely true? Now you're getting thoughtful. It's like, 
well, I'm a mother and I'm a sister and I'm a daughter. And no, it's not absolutely true. It's ridiculous. The third question is how do I feel when I believe I'm worthless, mm. dead, withering, sad, lonely. And the fourth question is who would I be without the thought or how would I feel if I didn't have the thought? Mm. The most common answer to that one is free. And then you flip it around to the opposite. It's like, I am worth something or I have worth, and then give me an example, or two, or three, or four. And you have to do that exercise at least 100 times to begin to retrain your automatic response. Mm. I mean, I've been teaching people to kill ants for a long time, automatic negative thoughts, but I just found these five questions, they're just so elegant to just have a dialogue with yourself. I'll never be successful or I won't have enough money um, or my life has no meaning. It's like, well, let's put that under a microscope. Not positive thinking, accurate thinking. Okay, so putting myself in the shoes of somebody that's trapped in one of these dragons my gut instinct, and you've done this so much more than I have, but my gut instinct is the part that they're going to struggle with the most is they're going to say the opposite, right? So I have worth, I have value. It just isn't going to feel true or it's going to feel true at such a low rung level. Like, yes, okay, fine. I have some value, but Jesus, is it enough to be worth everything that I'm going through? I find that people are so ill-equipped to accurately identify what their abilities are, their capabilities, their worth, their value, all that. But I'm like, don't even worry about what's true. Ask yourself what's useful. And if it's useful to tell yourself, I'm a good person, I have worth, and that gets you moving towards doing the things that are actually worthy, then we're going to do it. Does that make sense to you or do you think there's something better? Well, well not better. I like it. It's with each of the dragons in the book, I have their origin story. So where do they come from? What's the upside? Because mm -hmm. all the dragons have upsides. My abandoned, invisible, and insignificant dragon had tremendous upside for me. Um, how do you tame it? So it's more than just correct your thinking. So there are strategies. So for, for one, seeking significance, well, that's useful. And it could be volunteering at church. It, you know, whatever fits your definition internally of significance. And then I have meditations around each of them. Um, so think of that as foundational, like the wounded dragon. For example, I talk about EMDR eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And it's so powerful. It's when you're traumatized, it actually gets stuck in your brain. And we see a pattern, we call it the diamond pattern in the brain. So your emotional brain gets turned on and it can't go back to normal or healthy. And EMDR, they actually have you bring up the trauma while they get your eyes to move back and forth, and it settles it down. So as an example, 1996, so I've been doing imaging for 30 years. The first 20 years, it was like a horror film in my life, because I was getting picked on. And I mean, I had the New York Times pick on me, the Washington for Post the pick imaging, on right, me, right. and my colleagues calling me bad names, and I'm like, I just want to look at the brain. What's your problem? Um, and in 1996, I had the state of California's medical board investigate me. Yeah, I'd never for heard that year. before. It's crazy. And that was traumatizing. And I couldn't sleep. And one of the original EMDR trainers worked for me. And I walked into Jennifer Lendl's office in my clinic. And I'm like, you need to help me. After an hour of this treatment, I was absolutely fine. If they took my license from me, I could get a job, I could take care of my family, I was gonna be fine.
But you can just imagine, you spend a big chunk of your life trying to do what you do, and now someone's trying to take it away from you. Why does the lateral eye movement shift the brain so profoundly? That you go from, I can't sleep, this is a total mess, to one session and now I'm good. I think it's more than just eye movement. Um, there's another technique that's somewhat similar. That's a part of the same technique? It, no, it, but it's similar. It's called havening. Okay. And, but they're both bilateral hemisphere stimulation. So for example, um, off camera, we talked about how my dad died last year. And a couple of days after he died, um, in a random stack of papers, I'm at my mom's house just helping her organize things, mm. is a picture of my dead dad in the mortuary. And I'm like, what idiot? Because it just bothered me. And I noticed it was just bothering me throughout the day. You know, I'd see the picture and I'd be irritated. And, and then I'm like, oh, you help people who have this problem. And havening is bilateral hemisphere stimulation. So it's either rubbing your hands like this while you think of the trauma, um, it's rubbing your face, probably not cool in a pandemic, <laughs> um, or what my favorite thing is, and I do this a lot with my patients, is I have them hold their shoulders and then rub down to their forearms, and they do it for 30 seconds. And the idea is to get stimulation on both sides of your body? Getting both sides while you bring up the trauma. Do you have so, to do it yourself or can someone else do it for you? Either way. And people can learn about it at havening.org, like safe haven, havening.org. And so I did that with the picture and you rate it like on a scale of one to 10. And that was like a nine. I was pretty irritated by this. And after I did it for 30 seconds, it's like a four. And then after I did it again, the irritation was gone. I did it two more times for 30 seconds and I fell in love with the picture because it was the last picture of my dad on earth. And so there are techniques so that you don't have to live with trauma mm. spinning in your brain, whether it's EMDR, other people do tapping, which can be helpful or havening. I wanna speculate about why that's working so when I meditate, what's useful about meditation, the only times that it works for me are when I can really lock into the pleasure cycle of the breath. So I have to be thinking about optimizing the pleasure of each part of the breath. By doing that, I really pull my brain to like what is happening right here, right now. One, it helps because it's truly when you're breathing in a meditative way, it, it just feels good like purely hedonistically, it just feels good. And then my mind can't wander to whatever is freaking it out because I'm there in my breath. And I'm wondering if this is a, there's something about stimulating both sides of the brain that's the important part, or if this is just your focus is now locking in on the sensation of being touched or touching yourself and that disrupts because I, I think a lot about pattern interrupting, that you're just hitting the brakes on this runaway thought. And by touching yourself, by tapping, by whatever, that you, you're grounding in a physical sensation which stops your brain from thinking about the traumatic thing. That's sort of bullet point one. But bullet point two is that you fell in love with the photo. But let's take these one at a time. Do you think, is it the bilateral activation of the brain that's critical or is it just the focus? I think it's the bilateral hemisphere stimulation because a lot of times people will bring up trauma and focus on it and it doesn't make them feel any better. It makes them feel worse. But I did a study on EMDR. We took police officers who were involved in shootings and they developed PTSD and couldn't go back to work. Mm. And I scanned them and then I scan them during their first EMDR session. So while the therapist was bringing up the trauma and the person- You're scanning them in that moment in or you scan them moment, after it? In that moment. Interesting. And so, okay, before it you go lights on- lights up their emotional- what, what does it look like when they're PTSD'd out? So when they have PTSD, if you look at the scans I do, it looks like a diamond pattern 
where their limbic or emotional brain is more active compared to a healthy brain. Mm. And then in that trauma activation, it gets bigger, gets more intense. But after they did an average of eight sessions, calmed it down. And that psychological intervention had biological effects. Okay, so that all makes sense. Now, when I'm stroking myself, I am recalling the memory. I'm activating bilaterally my brain. I don't understand why that breaks the elevation of the emotion. Why? Yeah, and I, I'm not sure we know why. We just know it does. It was actually discovered by Francine Shapiro when she was in Menlo Park that when she looked left and then right and did it over and over again, what she was upset about didn't upset her as much. And it was really from that moment she then started working with soldiers from the VA. And did she comment on why she did it the first time? Was it accidental? It was accidental. So intriguing. Okay. Yeah. And now we have other groups like the Havening group. There's another group called Brain Spotting. But they all seem to be bilateral hemisphere stimulation tools to bring up the trauma and sort of suck the emotion out of it. So you still remember it. You know, I still remember being investigated by the medical board. Mm. But I don't get freaked out. Do you tell yourself a new story? So you pull, so one of the things I find most fascinating about memory is that every time you pull it into your working memory, you're affecting it. And so you can change the tenor of that memory, the emotional resonance of that memory as you hold in a working memory and then store it back. So as you're doing this, you're doing the havening, you're, or the bilateral eye movement or both, you're pulling the memory forward. Are you, to optimize the process, do you need to tell yourself a different story about it? Do you need to focus on the positive things that came out of it? I mean, you talk about being able to find positives in death. Is that what we're doing? Or you literally just need to think about it in the normal way that you always think about it in your, I'm sure, obsessive way. But as long as you're doing that bilateral contact, it's going to lower the emotion. For many people, that's exactly what happens. Um... Other people, not so much. And so then you have to go, what else is going on? Mm. And do they have a hurt prefrontal cortex? So a lot of the soldiers that we work with, they have PTSD and traumatic brain injury. People just didn't focus on the fact that they were around three IED blasts. And so when things don't work like you hope they would, that's where the imaging work I do becomes so helpful. What is up, my friend? Tom Bilyeu here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10? If your answer is anything less than a 10, I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called How to Build Ironclad Discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. Okay, so now let's talk about the second fascinating element here. So we understand now how to lower the emotional resonance, but how did you fall in love with that photo? It, so even when you retold it to me, it sounded like a change in story, that you went from that's a photo of my father's death to that's the last photo of somebody that I loved and cared about. Is that a narrative shift that's required to get that new emotional anchor or, or the, the association with that physical sensation is pleasant and therefore it paints that new emotion on an old memory? 
So part of it is skill. Um, my children get horrified if I want to watch Pollyanna, one of my favorite movies ever. Pollyanna teaches people to play the glad game. Whatever situation you're in, what is there to be glad about in this mm. situation? So I've trained my brain to do that over time. And when you take the emotion out, something's going to replace it. And if you have skill in managing your mind, you'll often look for what's right rather than what's wrong. And, and I've worked really hard on that because it wasn't my nature. Growing up, I was pretty anxious and I was masterful at predicting what's the worst thing that could happen mm -hmm. and then I'd make it worse. So it's Don't the know it. hallmark of people that have panic attacks. Mm -hmm. um, but I've worked really hard and it's the blessing of my job. I get to help people and in that I always help myself. Okay, so we need to identify what our dragons are. We need to engage our prefrontal cortex to make sure that we pump the brakes on that stuff. We need to reframe things, get good at the glad game, the Pollyanna game, whatever we're gonna call that. Right. Um, we need to engage with reality. So how are things really, instead of trying to run or hide from it, both the good and the bad. So don't over um, think you're a loser, failure, whatever. Um, yeah, it's completely not helpful because negative thinking disrupts brain function. Um, but at the same time, too positive of thinking you could be driving down the freeway at 125 miles an hour in the rain. I mean, positive thinking by itself is harmful. That mm. We have to be thoughtful and careful. No doubt. Um, right? And that's the prefrontal cortex. There's a whole chapter in the book on the dragon tamer. Mm. And it's like, how do you tame this dragon thunder? Um, and, and you do it with having forethought and judgment and impulse control, which means, oh, by the way, you have to feed it right. There's a whole section in the book on the scheming dragons, which is really how society is stealing your mind if you are scheming to make you worse basically yeah like there's the holiday dragon right oh it's thanksgiving let's eat terribly right uh, or it's halloween or christmas you know we're going to celebrate the birth of the baby jesus by eating terribly and hurting people it's like how, how does that make sense and there's a brand new 12-step program in this book uh, because there's the addicted dragons. I talk mm. about the bad habit dragons. And as I was writing that, I'm like, you know, the 12-step program for addiction was written basically in the 1930s. And there's not one neuroscience step in the 12 steps. Mm. It's mostly psychological, social, and spiritual. And I'm like, well, if a neuroscientist rewrote the 12 steps, what would he add? that step one in the traditional 12 steps is admit your life is out of control. And I'm like, no, that's step two. Step one is what do you want? Relationships, work, money, physical, emotional, but what do you want? Step two is your behavior getting you what you want. Mm. If it's not, then you need step three, which is get your brain right. Because I really think better brain, better decisions. Better brain, better relationships. Better brain, more money. Better brain, better life. How do we take a good brain and make it great? Well, I love that idea. It's really three simple things. And the first thing is you have to care about it. Yeah. When I first scanned myself in 1991, it wasn't good. And just the week before I'd scanned my 60-year-old mother and she had a gorgeous brain, and so I created brain envy. I wanted her brain. So here I am, I'm a double board certified psychiatrist. So for people who don't know what that means. So I'm a general psychiatrist and I have a specialty in kids. I'm a child and adolescent mm. psychiatrist. I'm a physician, I'm highly educated and I don't care at all about my own brain, right? I love watching football on Sunday. And, and when I saw my brain, I'm like, ouch this can be better. Mm. And so how do you make it better? Well, the second thing is you avoid anything that hurts it. And I have a mnemonic we can talk about called Bright Minds. Mm. It's if you wanna keep your brain healthy, you have to prevent 
or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. Yeah. So um, brain envy, got to care, avoid things that hurt it, do things that help it. And so what, what did we learn? That exercise boosts blood flow to the brain. Not believing every stupid thing you think calms the anxiety centers in the brain. Things like omega-3 fatty acids get your gut right because your gut makes most of the mm -hmm. neurotransmitters in your body. Well, the little tiny habit for brain health is before you go to make any decision, you ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And if you love yourself, because it's never about should, as mm. soon as you think you should do something, you won't do it, um, just because we're all four years old in our head and rebellious, it's you answer the question in a positive way because you love yourself, because you love yourself, your wife, your life, your mission. Um, mm. That's why you do the right thing. Because too often people go, oh, well, I can't have this and I can't have that. And as soon as you get into that deprivation mindset, it's not going to work. Mm. It's really interesting to me how often the answer that you push people towards, whatever their struggle is, is something that I'll call soft. Love comes up a lot, attachment, um, not being lonely, like things that you would expect a psychiatrist to give you a pill for, you've traditionally shied away from that. Obviously speak, it can be very profound, but that you're leading people to do um, maybe easier or more basic things first. What are some of the like just dead simple, easy things that people should be thinking about with protecting their brain? So if they want to answer, you know, I want to do something that's good for my brain, but they don't know what that is. Like what well, are so if they, things? So I went to my daughter's second grade class and I put 20 things on the board and I went- 20 things that are good for your brain? Just, just 20 things. 10 of them were good, 10 of them were bad. And I'm go separate them for me. They got them all right. Really? Except one thing. Marijuana? Orange juice. <laughs> Really? Okay. They put it in sense. the good category yeah, yeah. when in fact it's got way too much sugar. And whenever you unwrap sugar from its fiber source, it turns toxic in your body. And so, um, so is this good for my brain or bad for it? Or is it good for my child's brain or bad for it? And they come to you and they want to play football. Where does that fall? It falls in the bad category. Brain is soft about the consistency of soft butter. Your skull is really hard and it has sharp bony ridges. No, don't let them do that. And I had one billionaire, he goes, but my son really wants to do it and I've hired this you know, NFL coach. And, mm. and I'm like, oh, well, if he told you he really wanted to do cocaine, <laughs> would you go get him a dealer? Because it's the same freaking thing. Right, because uh, I have scanned, you know, we have 150,000 scans on people from 120 countries and contact sports damage the brain mm. about the same as cocaine. Whoa. I knew it was bad, I didn't know it was that bad. So, and we had talked before we started about I tend to get myself in trouble. And about 10 years ago, we started the world's first and largest study on football players, on professional football players. Mm and the level of damage is sad. But 80% of them get better when we put them on a rehabilitation program. Mm -hmm. So even if you've been bad to your brain, you can make it better and I can prove it. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to my audience about it before, but the thing that led me to you was massive anxiety that seemed to be getting worse by the day. And one of the things that helped me was crushing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts, and the, becoming a pattern interrupt and stopping that. Walk people through some of the things that um, aren't necessarily, because we'll get into diet, but that aren't diet related, that are really just um, the way that they allow themselves to think, whether it's the brain getting stuck and looping around um, repetitive negative things, whether it's negative thoughts that they never interrupt, like what are those things that really um, cause people problems that they may not even be aware of. We have a brain health assessment online. People can go to brainhealthassessment.com and go, which of the 16 brain types do you have? So let me take just a step back and then I'll answer that question. Whenever I see someone, so if you came to see me, um, I'm always thinking about the four circles of your life. So I'm thinking about your biology. So with anxiety, my first thought is areas in your emotional brain just are working too hard. Mm -hmm. And so it's driving that anxiety. So what's the biology? What's the psychology? Which is how do you think? 
and the environment that you grew up in. Um, what's the social circle? Um, because if you're around a lot of irritated, angry, negative people, you're more likely to be anxious. Mm -hmm. And what's the spiritual circle? Um, why do you care? Why you're on the planet? What's your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? So I'm always thinking bio, psycho, social, spiritual, and that way I end up helping whole people, not just, oh, you're anxious, take Xanax. Because mm -hmm. that's the quick answer that if you go to Kaiser, for example, and I just hired a doctor from Kaiser, and he saw 25 patients a day. So the 25 patient a day answer is Xanax, right. is let me give you a benzo, and the problem with it is once you start it, it's insidious. It changes your brain to need it mm. in order to feel normal. And so I'm like, so how else can we quell your anxiety? So there's some simple supplements like GABA or one of my favorites, magnesium, that can be really helpful. Um, but the psychological one, there was one day I um, was at work and I saw four suicidal patients, and that's hard for me. And then I saw two couples who hated each other and two teenagers who ran away from home. And so at the end of the day, I was worn out and I came home to an ant infestation in my house. And I'm cleaning up thousands of ants and I'm like, uh. and then it just hit me, ant, automatic negative thoughts. My patients are infested. And the next day, I went to work with a can of ant spray. And I put it on my coffee table. And I'm like, we need to help you get rid of these things that are infesting your mind. And they liked that. It was just something they could grab onto. So here's the exercise. Whenever you feel sad or mad or nervous or out of control, I just want you to write down what you're thinking. And Ask yourself if it's true. And I have um, a process, so I don't know, if you want, we could do it together. Pick a thought, any thought you want to share, and I'll teach you how to put a stake in it. Um, this is never gonna work. Okay, so here are the five questions. Is it true? It certainly could be true, yeah. It, but is it true? I can't say definitively. I don't know. Sure. Right? Yeah, Because I am not a fan of positive thinking. I am not. Interesting. Positive thinking kills way too many people. I'm a fan of accurate thinking. What do you mean it thinking. kills too many people? What do you mean? So they did a study at Stanford, 1921, on 1,548 10-year-old children. And they followed them for 90 years, looking at what goes with success, health, and longevity. And it wasn't the don't worry kids. It wasn't the happy kids. In fact, the don't worry, be happy kids died the earliest That's from accidents and preventable illnesses. The kids who lived the longest were the conscientious kids. The kids who said they were gonna show up at a certain time and they show up on time. Mm -hmm. The kids who got their homework done, the kids who were responsible, who actually had a bit of anxiety, because anxiety prevents you from driving at 125 miles an hour down the freeway in the rain, right? right? You need some anxiety. Obviously, too much it makes people suffer. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't going to work out. Is it true? I don't know. The second question is, can you absolutely know with 100% certainty it's not going to work out? No. No. Third question, how do you feel when you believe the thought it's not going to work out? Bad, anxious. Do you feel uncomfortable, uh, impending doom, this sense that you know it's overwhelming, you don't wanna look at it, you wanna turn away, you wanna go do things that are fun, that are just easy, immediate gratification, um, eating the marshmallow immediately. That, it's, it's sort of all at a limbic level, it's just emotion. And then how do you treat other people when you believe the thought? If I were to give into it, you're gonna be grumpier, grouchier, shorter with people, or just sullen and quiet. Yeah, so is it true, I don't know, 
Can I absolutely know that it's true? No. How do I feel when I believe the thought, anxious, worse? I mean, it's fueling the thing that makes you naturally upset. Fourth question is, who would you be or how would you feel if you didn't have the thought? If you couldn't have the thought? Mm. Certainly better, for sure. And I'm gonna, now I'm gonna start pushing you because one, I want this to be useful in my own life and then two, I want people listening for it to really be useful. I find that there's a certain point where the anxiety kicks over into it feeling purely biological. And what I mean by that is I can't differentiate between being cold and being anxious. They're the f same physical sensation. So I'm like, am I just cold or is this an exacerbation of the anxiety? And so one of the quotes that has just seemed so true to me in my life, and this isn't how they meant it, but this is, um, you'll understand in a second why it's always running so true. The only thing to fear is fear itself. So the only thing that I have to fear when it comes to public speaking is anxiety. It's like, if I didn't have to worry about the anxiety, I'm not worried about the performance or the outcome. I've done it so many times. And so before I go on stage, I have to meditate to calm everything down, to slow my breathing, to get the blood back into the right areas of my so brain. So in that situation, there's not negative thoughts that are driving you. Right, so in the beginning, I had to learn to stop that loop from even starting right. by killing that initial thought, which is why that was so powerful for me. So. Killing the ants is bi it's a biological treatment too, because when you believe these negative thoughts, it changes your physiology immediately. Um, so how would you feel if you didn't have the thought better, you said? So the fifth question is my favorite question. It's you take the original thought, this will not work out, and you flip it to the opposite to the exact opposite, not the narcissistic opposite, which is I will be the best ever. Mm. Um, so the opposite of it, this will work out. Do you have any evidence that that's true? If you're thinking about, you know, whatever the situation then you won't work out. Historical performance, sure. Just like once in your life or more than once? Uh, depending on what we're talking about, no, it could be years of success at something. Right. Somebody on my board just this morning, I'm dumb. And then when we switched it to I'm not dumb, she had like 50 reasons why she wasn't dumb, right? But if you don't challenge your thoughts, if you don't question your thoughts, you believe them 100% and then you act out of the belief. So learning how to clean that up is really important, but sometimes there are remnants of anxiety that are not driven by the negative thoughts and their diaphragmatic breathing is so important. So if I was you, um, well, and I used to be you, because before I'd speak, um, I'd be very nervous. And I was on the speech team in college, but I couldn't hold paper in my hand because it would shake. Right. It was like really irritating. And so I became masterful at diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. And it's super simple. Um, I put people in my office on the floor, put a book on their belly, and I teach them when you breathe in, make the book go up. When you breathe out, make it go down. The trick is big breath, take twice as long to blow it out. So it's like three or four seconds in, hold it just for a second, and then about eight seconds out. And that triggers a parasympathetic response. So you know the difference between sure. the fight or flight response. You have a sympathetic response. We're really anxious. Our hands get cold. So that's the cold connection. They start to sweat. Our muscles get tense. Our breathing becomes shallow and fast, which is inefficient for the brain. And you just you want to run away or you want to hit something. Um, you want to trigger the opposite, it's called a parasympathetic response, and that breathing pattern will do it. Also holding something warm will do it as well. And for, for some people, they'll just put their hands under warm water. Mm. And if you could get in a sauna, that's great, or get in a hot tub, you can't do that before you speak. But. So what is, like, if somebody comes to you, I know you're going to say that you scan their brain, like it's a bit tough for everybody watching at home, but what are, like, the, the basic protocols for some of the most typical things that you see? Is it, are you starting with diet? Are you starting with exercise? Like, how do you get people to take the, the sort of 
um, edge off whatever they might be experiencing? Well, I, I'm usually working always in those four circles. So, yes, I'll scan them, because if I don't look, I don't know, but not everybody can do it. So in Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, I think that's my book you read. They're One of, yeah. questionnaires that go, oh, well, you're more likely to have a limbic issue here, or basal ganglia and anxiety issue with these symptoms, or prefrontal cortex issue, which is so common for us. Um, and then I'll go, oh, well, if this is likely the issue, these are the supplements I would think about. And I tend to start with supplements. I mean, unless you're schizophrenic or you're a brittle bipolar person, I generally start with supplements first. Um, and so at home, people can go to brainhealthassessment.com, find out which of the 16 types they have, and then we'll work on the biology. Along with biology, yes, you should exercise. Of course you should. And there's certain kinds of exercise, especially coordination exercises. So racket sports, by far my favorite. Very few head injuries, but they work your cerebellum. And the cerebellum, I think of it as the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain. It gets no respect, <laughs> even though it's 10% of the brain's volume, but has 50% of the brain's neurons. Can you imagine something that has half the brain's neurons actually gets very little coverage uh, in the scientific media. And so what is the cerebellum doing? Is it um, to do with coordination? And well, that's movement? what they used to think. Yeah, coordination movement. But now we know 80% of it is dedicated to cognition and emotion. And cognition in what way? Just like general processing? Or? Processing speed. You want to talk about something near and dear to my heart. I would love to be able to process raw data faster. That's how I think of it. Um, I'm assuming then that's cerebellum. Cerebellum. So I start playing table tennis. That's step one. What else? What am I supplementing? What other activities am I doing? So a racket sport. If your wife likes ballroom dancing, become good at it because it's a coordination mm. exercise. And then you want to stimulate it. And there's certain supplements that I actually like, like theanine, because it helps you feel relaxed, but it really also helps you focus. And this is over the counter? Mm hmm Rhodiola, ashwagandha, ginseng. We actually make something we like called focus and energy. And we find it stimulates your frontal lobes and your cerebellum at the same time. So, and then stop hurting it. Alcohol is directly toxic to the cerebellum. I mean, that's why they make you try to walk a straight line. You can't <laughs> because your cerebellum's not working. It's right. being poisoned. Um, right, so I hardly ever drink. What are some other things that people do on a day-to-day -day basis that could be totally just horrific for that? So if you're playing football or your kid's playing football, what they're doing is they're banging their frontal lobes. And there's actually this really cool term I like. It's called cross cerebellar diaschesis. It's like, whoa. So what does that mean? If you hurt your left frontal lobe, it actually turns off your right cerebellum. Hmm. And if you hurt your right frontal lobe, it turns off the left cerebellum. And if you're heading foot soccer balls, you're turning off both sides of your cerebellum. Mm. So we just have to do so much better at protecting the brain. So with that insane string of interactions with the brain, how's that given you a, a new way to think about mental health? How should we reframe it? What, what has that taught you? So I have a new book coming out called The End of Mental Illness. And I, I realize that that's gonna get me into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. but. After looking at the brain, I've come to realize these are not mental illnesses at all, that they're brain health issues that steal your mind. Mm. And when you really unpack this one idea, it just changes everything. People begin to see their problems as medical and not moral. It decreases shame and guilt, it increases compliance, mm -hmm. it increases compassion and forgiveness because we begin to see bipolar disorder, schizophrenia or major depression like heart disease and no one is shamed for it even though all of them have lifestyle 
contribution. Where do you think that the stigma came from? Like why, because dude, it was not long ago where mental health issues was really, really stigmatized. I would say it's less now. I for years struggled with anxiety and didn't even want to tell my wife because I thought she would think less of me. Where do you think that all comes from? I, I think it comes from the fact that we don't think of these as brain health challenges. Um, mental illness places the emphasis on your mind, mm. which is vague and hard to define. The mind is created by the brain. And when your brain works right, you work right. Mm. But when your brain is troubled for whatever reason, you have trouble in your life. You're more likely to be anxious. You're more likely to be depressed. You're more likely to have cognitive problems or get the diagnosis of ADD. And if we don't ever look at the brain, then how do we care about it? Mm. Think about this. What other medical specialty virtually never looks at the organ they treat. Mm. And because we don't look at the brain on a routine basis like we look at your heart or your prostate or your breast, n nobody cares about their brain really. And, and when, when you don't look at the brain, you come up with all sorts of interesting theories about why people act the way they do, but you don't have any information on the actual biology. Mm. And so for someone who struggles with anxiety, what we learned is clearly not one thing. Your brain could work too hard, and that's why you're anxious, because you can't settle it down, or it doesn't work hard enough, so it can't suppress the anxious feelings. Or maybe there's a toxin or trauma, mm. and most people with anxiety, they go to a therapist, and they talk about what's going on. And so they're working really on the software mm. of the issue. But what if there's a hardware concern? I want to talk about the biology. I think this is really interesting. And do, would I think you would self-identify as religious, yes? You go yes. to church, you talk about church a lot. Um, how do you think about sort of religion and that one-to-one -one tie between the, the physicality of the brain and the mind? Um, there doesn't seem to be a conflict for you where there is for a lot of people. Yeah, no, not at all for me. To think all of this evolved out of random chance, I think actually takes more faith than believing in creative design. I've actually studied prayer and the impact of prayer on the brain. It's really interesting. Tell I've, me more. Uh, Go deep. What do you mean by that? What is the impact? So... We studied it in different states, so conversation different brain states, like different brainwave states, or different like. Well, we studied the life. brain in different prayer states. Okay. So, for example, I pray for you. Um, it's very intentional, very purposeful. Versus someone who does prophecy, which is one of the gifts in both the New Testament and the Old Testament, or speaking in tongues, which is a gift in the Book of Acts in the New Testament. It's really interesting because speaking in tongues is basically you're channeling the Holy Spirit. And I've actually scanned channelers, I mean, people who channel the dead, like the Long Island Medium and other people. And there's research on channelers because, you know, in the United States, we go, oh, no, that's not real. But in places like Brazil, half the population believes in it and engages in those kinds of spiritual disciplines. And so the theory was when you speak in tongues or when you channel, you have to drop the function in your brain. So you have to sort of drop the noise in your brain to become a vessel for the channel. And so give me, give me some of the brain waves. So full disclosure, I'm not religious at all, and I definitely will count myself in sort of the deeply skeptical, but I accept that there are things I do not understand. But could you look at a brain scan and know, ah, this person's in a, a prayer state or a meditative state? Like, are there certain things that you look for? Well, I, you have to compare it. So, for example, for the prayer study, we did both SPECT, which looks at blood flow and activity, and we also did quantitative EEG, okay. which looks at the electrical activity in the brain. So, if you think of alpha states or theta states, theta states being more meditative state, although meditation fooled us. 
you sort of think, oh, if when you meditate, your brain would get less activity. Mm -hmm. And that's true in your emotional brain. But in your thoughtful brain, it fires up. It actually increases something called gamma rays, which are super fast waves. And so you have to sort of know where in the brain you're looking. So when we, th we say brain waves, what we're looking at is how busy is your brain. And we measure it in something called waves per second or cycles per second. And zero to two cycles per second is called delta waves. And it's what happens when we sleep. Um, three to seven are theta waves, sort of daydreaming. People have ADD have higher levels of theta waves. So they're often in sort of a daydreaming mm -hmm. state. Alpha waves, eight to 12 cycles per second. And that people often train that to become in a more meditative, focused state. Mm -hmm. So I love hypnosis and I've done it ever since I was a medical student with my patients. Really? And so we almost think we try to get them into an alpha state. And then beta is 13 to 18 and high beta is above 18 and gamma is above 40. And so we can actually train your brain. Maybe you need less theta so you can concentrate better and not be so distracted. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we need to train up alpha. And it's very exciting for me because I first learned this idea in medical school, first do no harm. Use the least toxic, most effective treatment. So I would much rather do something like nerve feedback mm. for you than just start you willy-nilly on medication. But unfortunately, that's what's happening in our society. 85% of psychiatric drugs are prescribed by non-psychiatric physicians in 10-minute office visits. And, and I'm not opposed to them. I use them when nothing else is working, but it's not the first thing I think about. And in the end of mental illness, there's a whole chapter on mind medication versus nutraceuticals. Mm. And there's actually a table on which supplements have A-level scientific evidence for things like insomnia, anxiety, depression, ADHD, addiction. Um, and, and I'm pretty excited about that. All right, let's go back to the neurofeedback and meditation prayer. Like, how do we train ourselves to be in a different state? So I do a lot of creative writing, and there's just a certain state that I think is an alpha wave state, but reading your breakdown in the books, it may be more of a theta state. Um, so I'll meditate for 15 to 20 minutes. I, I am focused entirely on uh, diaphragmatic breathing. So. Um, I am trying to, what I think of as lower the background radiation. So all of my stress, all of my anxiety, I can get it to zero. And, and unless there's something really weird going on in my life, I can get it to zero pretty fast. Like I said, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, start diaphragm breathing, sort of all the worries and thoughts begin to go away. But you've got this um, neurofeedback that people are using. You referred to it as a game on a computer. What are people doing? How are they getting the neurofeedback? Do you need that? Can you get there through prayer and meditation? Like, how do, how do we begin to shift gears? Well, one of the reasons I really like neurofeedback is when people meditate, the only feedback they're getting is from themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when you have instruments that can actually measure it, you have a better sense. And then once we know it, and we have our goal, whatever that goal is, more creativity, more focus, less anxiety, irritability, then we can specifically set those training protocols and give you feedback to know where you are. Um, and that's actually how I came to imaging was through um, a treatment technique called biofeedback. So biofeedback, we measure things like hand temperature, heart rate, uh, sweat gland activity, muscle tension, breathing, brain waves. And so we know your baseline and then we teach you, so for example, to warm your hands. And if I teach you to warm your hands with your brain, mm -hmm. it's an automatic relaxation response. 
And so it triggers something called a parasympathetic response. So if you think of fight or flight is a sympathetic response, well, it's the opposite of that. And so, well, how do you teach someone to warm their hands? So first you put a little thermistor on their pinky and go, so what's your hand temperature? And then let's get hand warming images and let's see which one works for you. And so we'll write down 10 images that you might think would work for you and then we'll spend a couple of minutes on each image and then, you know, over an hour, you have a pretty good sense. One, if you can do it, children do it without any problem because they don't believe they can't. That is super interesting. But um, so it could be holding a puppy or putting your hands in front of a fire or holding a cup of decaf coffee or... And this uh, starts warming people's hands up. Yeah. And it, when you warm your hand, it sends a signal to the rest of your body to calm down. Because when you get stressed, your hands get cold mm. and they get sweaty. So when I was a young psychiatrist, I used to do a word association test with my patients. And I would talk about, well, think of a pencil. And nothing would happen with their hand temperature. Or think of your mother. And for me, when I think of my mother, my hands get warmer because she's this really good concept in my head. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you go think of your father, my hands get cold because we had a conflicted relationship. I mean, he's actually one of my best friends now, but it took a long time to get there. So your body responds to every single thought you have and your brain responds. And are they helping you or are they hurting you? And you can learn to change your body often by changing where you let your mind go. I wanna go back to hypnotism. So is there an element of that in this? Uh, and I, I think the first question we have to answer is, why is hypnotism powerful? Well, it helps you tap into a natural state. Are you, are you um, shutting a part of your brain down? No, actually we're activating. So that was so like, with, like with meditation, you know, it sort of fooled us. Yes, it calms your emotional brain, but it activates your cortical brain, the most evolved human thoughtful part of the brain. Um, hypnosis in the studies that have done tends to activate the happy side of the brain, which is the left front in people who are right-handed. And we're not talking about Las Vegas and making people cluck like chickens and all of that. We are in hypnotic states all the time. So if I drove to Vegas and that five hour drive seemed like it went by in two, it's called highway hypnosis where time gets distorted. I don't know if you ever like drove through a city and you like, I don't remember driving through the city, yeah, of course. but you did and you were obviously fully awake and competent and so on, it's a hypnotic state. So I'm just directing people into a natural state because they're more open, not more gullible, because you can't make people do things they wouldn't do. But I have found it helpful for sleep. It's helpful for pain. It's helpful for anxiety. And it just feels so good, mm -hmm. which is, I think, because I had a lot of anxiety when I was young, I, I think I gravitated toward these things because I teach my patients because they also help me. Yeah. So the idea of hypnosis making you open, what made me think of that is you were saying, okay, you can give people these images. They can actually begin to warm their hands. Uh, it made me wonder if, okay, do we first have to train them to light up that part of the brain that you're calling the happy part, which I've never heard that reference before. Um, so is, is that step one, teach them to light up the, the part of their brain that makes them more receptive? So some people are highly hypnotizable, mm. um, that when you put them in a trance, time gets distorted very quickly. And almost everybody can be hypnotized, but for some people like me, it's training. Mm. You need to do it, not one time and think of it as magic, but do it over time. And when you put yourself, when you do the diaphragmatic breathing, which I'm a huge fan of, you're actually beginning to put yourself in a hypnotic meditative state and then you can solve problems um, it just your whole physiology 
changes. Do you practice, like, do you teach people how to do self-hypnosis? So if, if a meditative state is hypnotic, then I would say, okay, it's simply focusing on the breath, returning, sort of letting go of the thoughts, coming back to the breath over and over and over. Um, is that sort of the baseline entry into this state or are there um, more typical things that you'll have somebody do like trying to warm their hands? Like what's the easiest gateway to this? And then how do people use it? So we have an uh, online program called Brain Fit Life and there's actually six hypnosis audios I do for them as if they were in my office. Um, so we begin to decrease the outside world by focusing. And then I'll have people focus on something above their eye level. And as I count to 20, I'm going to suggest to them their eyes are getting heavy. And about 12, their eyes start to get heavy. And I'll have them close their eyes. So we take their scattered attention to a spot, close their eyes, and then the attention gets focused inward. Okay, pause and then, there. What's happening in the brain? What are you trying to do in that first step? What I'm trying to do is decrease the noise. And then I'm gonna do diaphragmatic breathing for them, or really initially deep breathing if I hadn't already taught them diaphragmatic breathing. And there's a specific rate. I don't know if you've ever played with this, but three seconds in, six seconds out. Because that rate has been found to trigger a parasympathetic response. But I'm just getting them focused on what's going on internally. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have them roll their eyeballs up. I'll have them basically tense their muscles around their eyes, roll it down, and then we're going to do progressive relaxation. I'll have them imagine the relaxation spreading from the little tiny muscles in their eyes to their forehead to their scalp all the way down to the bottom of their feet. And then I'll do a deepening technique may have them walk down a flight of stairs or something similar to that. And then we'll do guided imagery. I'll take them park, the beach, the mountains, you know, whatever we decide on ahead of time that is relaxing for them. Get them to see what's there, feel what's there, smell, taste, the freshness in the air. And, and then we do the work. I had a 16-year-old boy who had panic attacks. Mm. And... I got him into a really nice, calm, hypnotic state, and then I had him remember the last time he had a panic attack. That's interesting. Why there? Exposure in a new... Safe. Okay. So one, we're relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's safe. And then in this safe meditative state, I would have had, I want to, you to imagine yourself getting younger and smaller, smaller and younger, and I want you to go to the first time you had a panic attack. And after a minute, he went back to when he was four years old. He had a steak stuck in his throat. He thought he was going to die. And someone did a Heimlich maneuver on him. And it was very traumatic for him. And he'd completely forgotten about it. And then, and this doesn't happen often, his mother was in the room, his 16-year-old boy. And I'm like, well, is there anything before this? because that was one of the sensitizing events. He actually went back to a time when he couldn't see, when it was dark, when he was wet, and something was choking him. And his mother knew exactly what happened. He actually went back to his birth and was born with the cord wrapped around his neck. I've never heard anybody talk about goals before. Like, I'm obsessed with that. And it just seems like people don't bring it up. Uh, but here we go. This is from the book. You're more likely to be able to protect yourself from dragons and ants. We've talked about those. When you have clear goals, a healthy blood sugar level, plenty of sleep, no alcohol in your system, and you talk about marijuana as well, which would be nice and controversial. You don't mention it in this quote, but um, you have in the book. And you are not hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And I thought that really sums up the protective mechanisms, the things you have to look out for and what you have to do. Um, walk people through why are goals so important? How, why is a guy that spent 40 years focused on brain health talking about that? And how did you come to realize just how useful that is? You have to tell your brain what you want because it's always listening. And if you don't know what you want, and I ask all of my patients, what do you want? They'll talk about money. 
or they'll like I have a 17 almost 18 year old daughter and she's had two boyfriends and I've dismissed them both but it's like what do you want and they talk about money mm. and I'm like no that's a side effect of a meaningful purposeful life having that as the goal is a terrible goal and I, I like money I always say to my team no margin no mission right? right you have to make money but if that's the point that's the prescription for unhappiness and I've always and I got this when I was a medical student it's people get burned out when they become unbalanced and so when i ask my patients what they want relationships work money it's important but it can't be the thing right physical emotional spiritual health what do you want in a balanced way because if you know then you're more likely to get it so for example you've met tana mm -hmm. uh I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with my wife. I always want that. But I don't always feel like that. But when I'm thoughtful, when I know my goals because they're posted, mm. I'm so much more likely to act like that, which means I'm going to have a great marriage. Especially if she has clear goals too mm. and we have similar goals for our relationship do you guys talk about your goals all the time and when you say they're posted where are they posted so I have them posted in my bathroom and I have them on my phone very smart and so, and and so everything it comes out I love like three letter three word sentences or three word questions and like for the ants is it true mm. and for goals is does it fit does my behavior today fit the goals I have for my life. So last night I was at the Orange County Fair. They had fried butter puffs. Doesn't fit mm. the goals I have, right? Because one of my goals is to be physically healthy. If you're trying to change a medical specialty, you want to live a long time because <laughs> it's going to take a long time. Yeah. And so I want to be healthy because that gives me energy mm. and happiness. And so the Butter fried butter puffs didn't fit. Yeah, I think this is a, a super underserved um, thing. It, it there's a great Tony Robbins quote: "If you don't know where you want to be in five years, you're already there." And I remember when I heard that, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like so many people have dreams about where they want to go and what they want to do, but they stay these sort of vague, amorphous blobs, and they never get defined, and therefore you never achieve them, and your future is always five years away, and you're just you're stuck in this perpetual sameness. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about that. So now, let's say that they have their goal, they've written it down, they posted it, they see it multiple places in their house. How do they go about getting the brain that they're going to need to actually get there? So we know that we don't eat our butter puffs. In fact, what I'll ask is, why don't we eat our butter puffs? We wanna live a long time, I get that, but specifically, what, what is the problem with Fried what, butter? Yeah, like what makes something <laughs> bad food? I think that's the right way to ask it. Uh, I come up with this new phrase I just love so much uh, that you only want to love food that loves you back, mm. that you're in a relationship with food. I think 30% of the mental health problems in America are related to our terrible diet, uh, that you are what you eat in large part and if you're eating i call them the weapons of mass destruction highly processed pesticide sprayed high glycemic low fiber food like substances stored in plastic containers you're not going to be healthy mm. you poison your gut you're poisoning your brain and i publish three studies now the last one on 35,000 scans, one of the world's largest imaging studies. Tom, you will not believe this. There was a linear correlation on virtually every area of the brain as people's weight went up, the activity and blood flow in their brain went down. I believe it, unfortunately. So, 
healthy weight, overweight, obese, morbidly obese in a linear mm. fashion. When I saw those graphs, when I was doing the research, I was just like horrified. And I come from a family of fat people. Uh, my dad used to hate when I'd say that, but I have a brother that's 150 pounds overweight wow. and a sister, the same thing. And I know if I just ate everything that looked good to me, I would be too. And no, I'm not having that, especially because I don't want a small brain, right? right? And, and people go, oh, that's fat shaming. And I feel terrible about it because 72% of the country is overweight. Think about that. I mean, oh, how insane is that? 42% of people are obese. The pandemic made it worse. We should be worried about that because the extra fat on your body produces inflammatory cytokines. And we know inflammation is a major cause of depression and dementia. The fat on your body takes healthy testosterone, which we need, right. which men and women need, and it turns it into unhealthy, cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. That's a bad thing. Fat stores toxins. We need to get serious about being at a healthy weight with healthy food. Mm. Um, and so diet is critical, exercise, supplementation, I think is really important. I did a study, 97% of the population um, low on omega-3 fatty acids. And so finding ways to supplement about 80% of us are deficient in vitamin D. Yep. In a pandemic, that's not okay. Nope. Right? Because people with low vitamin D actually die more mm. if they get COVID-19. So Yeah, going back to what you're saying about fat shaming. So first of all, I come from a morbidly obese family as well. And I've often said that you... When you love something, you don't hate on it, look down on it. Like I don't think less of people because they're obese. Uh, but going back to the idea of facing reality, at the same time, I know that I will lose them earlier than I absolutely have to if they continue to live that lifestyle. And so getting people, especially now in a pandemic, to just face that it isn't fat shaming to say you're more likely to survive this disease that's ravaging you know the entire human population if you are living a healthy lifestyle get your weight under control exercise eat right work out all of that stuff um, because there's nothing worse than trying to solve a problem when you ignore the thing that's actually causing it like you're just at that point it's really about symptom mitigation versus figuring out what's really going on um, do you think that this, so going back to weight specifically. I want to pick up on that for a second because I learned a long time ago as a psychiatrist, if you don't admit you have a problem, mm. you can't solve it. Dude, that is so true. Until I finally admitted to my wife that I was anxious, I, I couldn't make progress. And finally, I just was like, fuck, I have to tell her. And it really did not make me feel good about myself because, you know, there is something about the way that she would look at me like I could do anything. And that felt so good. And to finally be like, yo, I'm over here. I am struggling, homie. Like, this is really gnarly. And of course, it wasn't the turn off that I feared it was going to be. And it only brought us closer together. But that was really hard to admit. But then once I could say it out loud to the person that was the only person I really cared about impressing, then it was like, okay, now I can actually deal with this. Because when you become more real, you become more relatable. And this, so many guys don't understand this, that they deny that mm -hmm. they have a problem because they want to be perceived as the person who has it all together, but then nobody can relate to you. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons I became really vulnerable in the book. And I haven't gotten any haters. <laughs> I mean, I have plenty of haters, don't get me <laughs> wrong, but from writing For that. A, from on that stand, um, but I remember when I did the big NFL study mm. at a time when I'm the NFL trauma. was sort of lying, they had a problem. And my letter to the commissioner, is, you don't admit you have a problem, you can't solve it, and it's going to get worse. Yeah. And, and that came from marriages where especially the guy wouldn't admit that they were struggling. Mm. And it ended up falling apart. Yeah, I can certainly understand that. So, okay, we 
admit that we have a problem, whether it's about weight or whatever. Um, how do we begin to unwind this stuff? That's really, I think, the, the important thing. Is it, does it just come down to, look, there are, because you, you write in the book and I wrote them down so I can read them out if we need to, but um, they're just, are there just certain things you just have to do and you just, you have to do them. And until you do them, like this is never going to change. Well, and that's the bad habit chapter. You know, I have the bad habit dragons. There's mm. the overeater bad habit dragon. The worst of all the dragons is the oblivious dragon. The dragon is that an intentional like you're intentionally being oblivious or people that really just don't know you just don't know and you haven't taken the time you go i'm fat because everybody in my family's fat it's mm -hmm. like no i have a lot of fat people in my family and i'm not because i don't give in to the behaviors making right. it likely to be so and so it's about being intentional reading the labels of the food you eat of the products you put on your body, it's asking yourself this one question. Is this good for my brain or bad for it, mm. right? I mean, ultimately in all of my books, I try to create brain envy. I want people to love their brains. Um, and is this good for my brain or bad for it? And the reason that brain envy works, just to be clear, is because you can improve your brain. How exciting is that? And I've proven that over and mm. over and NFL players and soldiers and police officers that you're not stuck. And intuitively people should know that, right? If I don't sleep tonight and I'm not gonna think well tomorrow, but no one's thinking about the physical functioning of their brain. So I'm in Justin Bieber's um, new docu-series, Seasons, and he came out, I've been his doctor for a long time. And like many celebrities, he'd do it, I'd say, sometimes. <laughs> Show up sometimes. But then, because he went through a really hard time, he came into my office and he said, I get it. My brain is an organ like my heart is an organ. If you told me I had heart problems, I'd do everything you say. I'm going to do everything you say. And he got radically better. Mm. And you got to love it. And... And we have to stop this whole mental illness thing. I hate it because it's not mental illness. It's brain health. Right. Get your brain right and your mood is better. You're mm -hmm. happier. You're more focused. You make less bad decisions, which will decrease your anxiety. Speaking of anxiety, so you said earlier that you think 30% of mental health, brain health problems are tied to um, diet. In my end of one experience, I think it's even higher than that. So when I think about, okay, suffering from profound anxiety, I'm trying all the mental tricks and there's no doubt they helped. I mean, very, very beneficial. But I just couldn't, I felt like I was learning to better cope with the symptoms, but I wasn't eliminating the symptoms. And so I was like, what is going on? And then of course, because of what my wife went through from a health perspective, become aware of the gut, start really thinking about what I'm eating and that there are gonna be things that might be messing me up that I just would never have guessed. Um, long time listeners of my show will grow tired of hearing the following statement, but at the beginning of COVID, I went through something really weird that I'd never experienced before. I was getting super tired all the time, brain fog, just like, almost losing my zest for life. And I was like, this is really bizarre. And I thought, okay, well, what would you tell somebody if they came and described those symptoms? And I was like, no matter what I would tell them, it's something that you're eating because that's just so true in terms of the way, if your body's being affected, your brain's being affected, it's almost certainly something you're eating. And I'm like, but my diet's so healthy. Like, how could this possibly be? And I was like, just eliminate whatever you're eating a lot of and see what happens. And I'm like, what am I eating a lot of? And I was like, pecans? And so I cut out pecans, 48 hours later, I was back in business. I was like, how the hell is it possible that pecans of all, the, and they were like raw, they weren't even like roasted. I mean, these were like the fucking, all but just plucked off a tree. So I was, I, anyway, I couldn't fathom that that was it, but it was it. And then that got me thinking, wait a second, could my anxiety be tied to something I'm eating? And so then I started cutting out anything processed because dude i love my zero calorie drinks love them in a way i can't even begin to tell you but of course that comes with a lot of chemicals that i've never even heard of and i've heard of a lot of chemicals and 
in cutting all of that out, the what my anxiety feels like to me now, I might still have a thought about something's going to go wrong in the future. And that will trigger that, that feeling of like, ooh, something bad is coming. But it never escalates. Food is so important. And um, when I put my patients on an elimination diet, so we basically eliminate the bad things, mm. um, they get so much better. And the nutritionists that work with us have more success stories than the psychiatrists. And <laughs> it used to irritate me. Food matters. What you put in your mouth, your microbiome mm. matters. We have these hundred trillion bugs in our gut. And what we feed them, you know, helps to grow the ones that make you happy, or they ha help to grow the ones that make you angry and sad. Um, it's just so important. And our biggest blog last year, uh, I wrote one called I Told You So. And when I, and I started with when I dated Tana, she told me I will never tell you I told you so. <laughs> she lied. It's like her favorite thing to say. And then I said, but the American Cancer Society just came out and said you shouldn't drink. Why? It increases your risk of seven different mm. kinds of cancer. Not to mention it prematurely when, ages. When people your were brain. giving that advice, I was like, uh, like this one just doesn't land for me. It just doesn't seem possible that it would be essentially a health food. What about weed? Marijuana is uh, in. That it's very in. My it's friend. in. I published a study on a thousand marijuana users. Mm. Every area of their brain is lower in activity. Oof. Now, does help some people? Like when my father and what? What does it actually help with? It helps increase appetite. For some people, it can actually decrease seizure frequency. Mm. It, it suppresses activity in the brain. I, I'm very worried because as the perception of dangerousness of a drug goes down, yeah. its use goes up, especially in teenagers. Right. And if you're smoking or eating edibles as a teenager, you've just increased your risk of anxiety, depression, and suicide in your 20s. Oof. So that's, it's not good. And I, you know, all child psychiatrists, I'm also a child psychiatrist, have the experience of all of a sudden the 16 year old is not acting right. And we test them and they end up positive for marijuana, mm -hmm. that it's not innocuous. Right. And, and I think that's the important thing. Now, is it worse than alcohol? Well, actually, I published a study on 62,000. This is the world's largest imaging study, 62,000 scans on how the brain ages. And then we looked at what accelerated aging. Mm. Schizophrenia was the worst. Your brain looked 10 years older than people who didn't have schizophrenia. The second worst, and it was a surprise for me, was marijuana. Your brain worse looked, than alcohol. Look worse than alcohol. Worse than smoking. What? Yeah. I am startled by that. Yeah, I was too. And it's like it's the data, and wow. I have no dog in the fight, right? If you smoke, if wow. you don't smoke, you're just actually more likely to see me if you do. Is it lowering blood flow? Like it's what's lowering the mechanism? blood flow to the brain. Wow, and I thought it, for sure you were going to say alcohol was the worst. Yeah, but neither of them are good. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, so food can make you happy. So right. can <laughs> drugs. That's the that's the problem. Like when I think about all the the insults that people can do to their brain, how important the brain is for the mind, and that your mind, if you don't have your mind under control, your life your life will be determined by how well you control your mind. Like I just because ultimately all we are is a string of emotions. Things either make you feel good, bad, or indifferent. And when you spend a lot of time feeling bad, life sucks. When you spend a lot of time feeling good, life is great. And it doesn't matter if you have all the money in the world. If you feel bad, life sucks. It doesn't matter if you're broke as a day is long. If you feel good, life is great. So, but the number of things that insult our brain from just concussive trauma from certain types of contact sports to um, sitting around to uh, weed, alcohol, a lot of things that are fun, gadgets. over prescription of drugs, oh my God, gadget screen negative time, news. like, yeah, negative thoughts, like, it is bananas. 
and the amount of time but, that people have to put into getting it right. So we have a high school course called Bright and Thrive by 25. And I, I love this course. And we play a game with them mm -hmm. called Who Has More Fun? The kid with the good brain or the right. kid with the bad right. brain? Who gets the girl and gets to keep her because he doesn't act like an ass? The kid with the good brain or the kid with the bad brain? Who gets into college? Mm -hmm. Who gets the job they want? Who has the most consistent positive behavior? It's the person with the good brain. This is not about not having fun. It's about having fun with all of you right. intact. Yeah, and over a prolonged period of time. Over a prolonged period of time. Dr. Amen, thank you so much for coming on. Dude, I always love your books and time with you. Where can people connect with you and ensure that they have the good brain over a long period of time? Well, they can find us at amenclinics.com. So amen, like the last word in a prayer, clinics.com. They can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Instagram, it's at doc underscore amen. We're doing a whole cool series called Scan My Brain. I've done some just wonderful influencers. It's super fun. And um, we want to create a revolution in brain health. We want to end mental illness, end that whole discussion, and really start talking. With a better brain always comes a better life. Where cancer patients mm. are taking psychedelics to deal with the existential crisis of a cancer diagnosis. That's even higher than, to me it's like, because you're starting to think like there's parts of me are eating myself from the inside and growing inside me. It could give you a real sense of what, what is identity.